and I'm going to click broadcast in three, two, one. Well, hello and welcome to the Asian American Business Development Center's webinar series entitled Let's Return to a Better Workplace. Uh, our session today, uh, thank you for being with us first off, uh, is hosted by the Asian American Business Development Center, uh, the Asian American Business Development Center, or AABDC. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization established in 1994. Uh, its aim is to assist Asian American businesses in strengthening their capacity to compete in the mainstream market, to expand business opportunities, as well as to promote recognition of Asian American businesses contributions to the general economy overall. Today's session, uh, which is going to be a great one, uh, it, we would like to thank series partner Hennessy. Uh, the webinar series is sponsored by Bank of America, Target, Colgate, Palmolive, JP Morgan, Chase and Company. Of course, always thanks to the, the sponsors and the series partner Hennessy, as well as the sponsors. Um, this is the third and the last webinar in the series titled Finding Solutions Together. Uh, we will highlight lessons from Asian American, African American, and Hispanic Latino American communities and their allies in rallying to fight racism, discrimination, and to at the same time stimulate business recovery and community revitalization uh, during the, this very difficult period. Now, the uh, unprecedented, you're going to hear that word a lot, health, social, and economic consequences of the pandemic uh, has really made the case or really exposed the gap, the need of bold, uh, focused actions. In 2020, um, it is important that businesses and the leaders of these businesses work together to try to advance the issues related to social justice while empowering the multiple diverse communities throughout the country. And by doing so, uh, being inclusive and deliberate uh, in an attempt to together uh, find economic recovery. Our panelists, yeah, the other folks you see here, uh, will discuss examples of corporate responses in support of economic recovery from the converging pandemics, uh, what some may call both racism and COVID-19. Uh, some housekeeping notes for you. Um, if this is your first rodeo, and it probably is not, uh, we're excited <laughs> to hear from our panel as well as you, the audience. So um, that little button that says Q&A, please use it. Use it a lot. Be nice, but please do engage. Um, I'll be looking at that throughout the conversation, uh, looking for some very good short questions. Um, also, uh, you can use the chat function if you like just to you know, be part of the community and the conversation. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel for today. We're joined today by Tim Ryan of PwC, Giles Woodier of Moet Hennessy USA, Stephanie Lomibau Para of Bank of America. And I'd like now to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. And Giles, uh, as our partner for the series, you get that great honor of kicking it off for us. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so um, just, just a minute on myself. As you can tell, um, I'm not originally from the US. I, um, I'm from London in England, but I've been here now in, in the US for, for 19 years and um, adopted citizenship here about 10 years ago. So um, I think I've become American in, in many ways, if not in my accent entirely. Um, I started out my career mm -hmm. in London uh, working in the creative advertising space worked in a number of different uh, businesses, working with some remarkable clients, uh, from Cafe Pacific to Land Rover, uh, across a, a host of different industries, which I really think gave me a good um, platform to be able to look at challenges and issues from many very different lenses, as opposed to one category. And then when I moved over to the US, uh, I worked uh, uh, for uh, Diageo at first, which is a, a British drinks company, then moved to Bacardi, which is um, uh, originally a Cuban, uh, but now a, a sort of Latin American company. 
in many, many ways. Um, before them coming to Moat Hennessy, where in my role at Moat Hennessy for the last five years, I've been running Hennessy Cognac. And um, Hennessy Cognac, is, as you probably would all know, is a very, very international brand. But also, if you look at the wine and spirits space, it's safe to say it's probably uh, the leading polycultural uh, spirit brand, one that has a, a, a near and dear place in the hearts of many African-Americans, Latin community, and the Asian-American community. And that's why we have such a vested interest in that space. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, and then I, I think, Richard, I'm, I'm supposed to hand over to Stephanie. Is that right? Yeah, why not? Over to you, Stephanie. Great. Th thank you. Thank you, Giles. Uh, Stephanie Alomi Valapara, as Richard mentioned, I'm a Senior Vice President and Environmental Social Governance, or ESG Philanthropy Program Manager for the Bank of America Charitable Foundation. I got my CUAGs working in the nonprofit the industry for over 10 years for coming to the financial institutions. I worked at WAMU and I'm so, so proud to have over 11 years here at Bank of America where we care about investing in the communities that our employees live in and serve. That's 91 cities and communities across the United States, three international regions outside of the U.S. with a sole focus on immediate and long-term economic resiliency and economic mobility. Um, most recently, uh, our company, with the leadership of our CEO, announced a $1 billion over four years public commitment to address racial and economic inequalities exposed by the pandemic. And so I'm really, really honored to be among this esteemed panel and with you, Richard. And I want to take this moment of personal privilege to thank John and his entire team at AABDC for hosting this really important conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And I guess yeah, I'm passing you. this over to Tim. Sure, and I'll keep on talking mm -hmm. too. Hey, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Richard, uh, Stephanie, and Giles. Um, <laughs> it's great to be here. Let me first start by thanking John and the Asian American Business Development Center, the work that you're doing, not only these webinars and this being the third one, but the work that you do in our communities is amazing. And I've had the privilege of working with John for a number of years. So just thank you for that leadership and everything you do for, for our Asian American uh, community. Uh, so my name is Tim Ryan. I'm the chairman and senior partner, the CEO of PwC. Uh, we have 55,000 people here in the U.S. We have 20, uh, 270,000 people across the globe. And uh, I've been in that role now for four years, just going into my fifth year. I also have the privilege of being the co-founder of a group called CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. And that is a group that we started three years ago to help the business community improve on diversity and inclusion within the four walls of each of our organizations. When we launched that three years ago, we had 112 CEOs join, and today we are, we are at over 1,300 CEOs across the United States that represent over 30 million employees in the United States, and the website is ceoaction.com. We also, when George Floyd was killed, we broadened the scope of CEO Action, and we invited members to um, contribute a fellow, one or more people from their organizations, to create a 250-person startup to work on public policy around racism around the United States. And next week, we onboard the first 250 people that are coming from 150 companies to work exclusively on policymaking related to racism across the United States. And that's something we're really excited about and I'm sure we'll talk about later. It's an honor to be here. The topic is important. I'm looking forward to the panelists and the group to really having a deep dialogue on what I consider to be one of the most societal, the biggest societal opportunities we have in our country these days, which is to be more inclusive. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all three for introducing yourself. Giles, let me start with you on this. Um, what have you seen in your business as well as your, your partners when it comes to the magnitude of what we are going through? I mean, we're, we're about a half year into it right now. Um, now, six months in, how are you seeing things differently today, Giles, than you did six months ago? You know, it's interesting. I'm a, I'm a keen student of history, and I was listening over the weekend to a podcast that talked about the history of restaurants. And um, this is the first time in human history um, that restaurants really around the globe have had to shut down restaurants, bars, and locations like that, which is, which is a, a key part of our industry. The impact on the hospitality industry alone has been horrific. And I know how deeply that's also affected the, um, the Asian community, um, specifically just in New York alone. It's had an, had an overwhelming impact. 
So, I mean, obviously from a global perspective and from a societal perspective, we can see the impact on everyone's health. We can see uh, the tragedies that have occurred. But for us specifically in our industry, it's been a, it's been a remarkable um, uh, sort of uh, six, seven months where we've seen a complete shutdown um, and for, for all the, uh, the hospitality industry. And so when we were thinking about um, how we could help people, we were thinking about two lenses. First, the lens of our, our actual consumers themselves, which as I said, is a very polycultural base. Um, but also we were thinking through the lens of our nearest and dearest partners, which is restaurants, hotels, um, and, and bars in every neighborhood. So that's been the biggest impact. And you've seen a, a real pivot in terms of how we're now trying to um, allow consumers to enjoy themselves and enjoy our products in different ways, but sort of supporting to go cocktails and the like. But, but it's gonna be devastating and has been. And just to give you one uh, statistic, out of all the restaurants and bars in the country, the expectation is that 30 to 40% of them will permanently be shut as a result of this pandemic. And it'll take years for that to be able to recover. So Giles, uh, given that, um, and that is very frustrating but, and dynamic in a bad way, what are you doing as an organization to ready these partners, these customers for the next six months? Well, one of the things that, that became very clear to us is I think it was around, I remember it was around St. Patrick's Day that things really became, um, you know, uh, clear. Everything began to shut down around that sort of 17th of, of March. And um, we spent a couple of weeks really trying to think hard about he how Hennessy could support businesses and Hennessy could support the consumers. There are a lot of great companies that stepped up within uh, a very, very short space of time uh, that donated money to existing organizations to be able to help fund them. Um, but we wanted to be able to create something, co-create something that we felt would have an ongoing legacy. It wouldn't just be about this crisis. And if you look back, you can look, there's always gonna be a crisis that will affect the communities that, um, that we've, we've been talking about, the Asian community in, in particular, as well as the, uh, the black and Latin community. And that was when we decided to create a, a charitable organization called Unfinished Business. And that was really trying to put resources directly back into the hands of the communities that were hit the hardest. And that was when we decided to partner with uh, John and the Asian American uh, Business Development Center, as well as an organization called 100 Black Men, which is a mentoring um, uh, uh, sort of uh, organization and the Hispanic Federation. So the first stage was to envisage how could we help? How could we help the communities? How could we help the consumers as well that have been hit the hardest? The second was to find the right partners. And we're delighted uh, to have been able to partner with John. He's been a terrific partner to us and we've already had a pre-established relationship. And then what we've been doing is fueling uh, funds into unfinished business so that it can make its way to the businesses that have been hit the hardest. And we don't see this as being a uh, COVID only initiative. We see this as being the catalyst for something that can continue into the future and, uh, and, and continue to help these businesses get back on their, uh, on their feet. I'm gonna to get to our other panels, no doubt. Quickly, uh, 30 seconds, Giles. What have you seen to these businesses that you've helped across uh, this, these intersectional communities? Give me a number. So, so far, we, 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 the response was overwhelming. Um, over the first uh, week, we had 17,000 responses within a week. Uh, and so far, out of those 17,000, we've been able to help uh, directly over 1,300 of them going through the process where John and his team have selected the criteria that allow us to help them. We started out with an initial seed fund of $3 million, which we put in uh, to the fund. And now we've doubled that up to 6 million, but that's just the start of the process. So it's, um, I think what I can say is that we, we've really learned just the depth of how many businesses are crying out for help yeah. and how difficult it has been for them to get the funding that they've needed. Stephanie, um, what have you yes. seen in the past six and look forward, what does that inform you in terms of how do we ready these communities of business and of people for the next six months. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And I love what Giles had said. Um, similar to the process Hennessy went through in terms of thinking through what could we do to make a meaningful difference, what could be long-term, 
the bank takes an environmental social governance approach to our responsible growth, the way we live our value of bettering the financial lives of people. But six months from today, there was the COVID pandemic and the COVID crisis that hit. Uh, and we saw a lot of community struggle. We saw the fragility of the economy, right? Because so many businesses were shuttered. We saw the long lines in food banks and we thought, here we were investing significant resources in our, into our communities, especially in workforce. And yet when the economy shuts down, unfortunately people didn't have enough to be able to provide day-to-day -day resources, day-to-day -day basic needs for themselves and their families. So we really have to think through, well, what communities are most vulnerable to this pandemic? And then we saw that devastating death of George Floyd. And we heard about so many instances from Ahmaud Arbery to Breonna Taylor to Rashad Brooks. And we saw it firsthand because now what's different from in the past was some of these instances of racial unrest. We saw it firsthand. We felt it. We knew it was wrong. And it motivated our CEO to say, I know we're doing great work in social justice. We're doing great work to understand the disparities of economic mobility and communities of color. But we need to do more and we need to do more now. And his push to that one billion really does reflect our overall awakening consciousness as I mean, as individuals about the need for more civil rights and social justice when it comes to racial systemic racism. Um, and it's not just isolated. For this community and for purposes of this conversation, what's so powerful about today versus six months is the interconnectedness, right? We know every human should be treated fairly. And we know that this movement isn't just about black and brown, people of color, indigenous. It's about ensuring that everyone has equitable opportunity for success, especially with businesses. Um, the presidential debate to last night was chaotic, but the one thing I kept taking away, probably because I was preparing for today, is one in six small businesses, one in six small businesses will not be able to reopen as a result of the closed economy. Um, we know that they're suffering, and we know based on that McKenzie report that so many of our Asian American Pacific Islander communities and small businesses have been impacted. And so we've been really thinking through how our lines of businesses could be part of the solution and not just the philanthropy. And so we're doing a lot more investing in equitable financing. And I could go into specifics later on in the conversation, Richard, but just know that our eight lines of businesses are thinking very, very clearly and deliberately around how we could address racial and economic inequities. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Tim, uh, as you overlook so many types of businesses and sectors, and now you have the comfort of six months, if you wanna see it that way, but how has the dominant structure of the way business will live in the six, next six months changed? Are businesses now effectively all social impact businesses? Yeah, so, um, so thanks, Richard. I, one of the things I learned in my career is I never say all or none because I'll be wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but, but with, yeah, um, but, but without a doubt, without a doubt, I'll be the first one to acknowledge our world has a lot of opportunity for improvement whether that in, in almost every element. One of the things I'm optimistic about over the last six months is it's brought the best out of business. The, the super majority of businesses, large and small, we've seen the best of them. Like when you listen to Giles and Stephanie and there are two great stories among thousands where businesses are leaning in more than ever. I, I, one of the things I, I've seen, and again, we see the world through the eyes of thousands of clients, right, that we, we serve. I, I don't view the world as an or world, I view it as in an and world. In other words, businesses for decades have been focused on driving profits. I now see them focus on, I don't view it as profits or social, I view it as both. And we're seeing businesses lean in more than ever. It's brought out the best of businesses. When you hear the stories that you heard, we have our own story and thousands have their stories. I think you're going to see more and more of that. The reality is one of the things that this pandemic has done that's unfortunate, it's widened the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Big and small, we've seen a divergence. So large companies, and again, certain sectors aside, large companies are thriving. And as Stephanie and Giles pointed out, small businesses are really struggling, and this pandemic has widened that gap. I, what I'm encouraged by is big businesses leaning in. It, they're dependent on that in the communities, in their supply chain, and their employees where their families work. 
and I'm seeing more of that happen than ever before. I think the next six months, 12 months, 24 months, you will see businesses focusing more on what we call ESGs, whether it be environmental, social, or governance, doing more than they've ever done before. And we're seeing that at the board. We're seeing that at the CEO levels with leading CEOs like Brian at Bank of America and others leaning in broader than we've ever seen before. I, I think I, our sense is that we're, we're at the pandemic didn't cause it. The pandemic accelerated businesses thinking around broader ESG and the responsibility. But I, I, I wouldn't go as far to say it's not about profits because the reality is, is investors that require a return on their capital, I think it's, they're one and the same. Like you can't be successful. You can't be relevant to your customers if you're not balanced. You can't be relevant to your employees if, you're not, if you don't have a focus on ESG. So I, I'm encouraged by the direction that we're going. I realize it's a choppy world. I don't think it's a straight line, but we're seeing more and more businesses than ever before. And I'll just give you a couple of just brief, brief examples. If you look at where we were three years ago around companies who were focused on climate, um, it, was, it was a good number of companies, but over the last three years, it's accelerated. It's hard to find a company today that doesn't have a net zero plan uh, to get to net zero as an organization. It's hard to find a company that doesn't have a climate plan. And that's been tremendous progress. And we need to make more. It's hard to find a company that, that today doesn't have a diversity inclusion plan. And these are now becoming mainstream. And I'm encouraged by that. I'm also encouraged by the transparency that companies are bringing in more and more willing to be transparent and the like. So I think the next six months, 12, 18, 24, will be, will be more of the same and even at increasing levels. How much, would, if you had to give it a percentage, Tim, is business going to change long term? Whatever it yeah. was before. If it was 100% before, is 30% going to stick long term this, of the change? Yeah, so I so that's that's um I'll give you let me give you my view. I think a hundred percent changes. So again, but let, let me explain that so I just to put it into context. When you look at our world today, there are some undeniable forces, and this is not just pandemic. I, I frankly think we gotta make sure we don't get mired down the pandemic, which is here and now we gotta deal with it. There's tragedies, but there were issues and opportunities prior to the pandemic. So when we look at the asymmetry in our world, and that, that was pre-pandemic in terms of wealth gap that, that we saw growing across the last 10 years in our society, that, that's an issue and an opportunity. I think 100% of businesses are going to have to deal with that in some way or form. We're seeing that pre-pandemic with companies like Walmart raising minimum wage, companies like JP Morgan raising minimum wage, or companies like Bank of America raising it, companies like PwC leaning in. That was pre-pandemic. I think it's going to be, your, companies will have to be all in on that. If, if you want to be relevant. So asymmetry matters. When I look at trust and transparency, we have seen growing trust gap between government and society and business and society. One of the big benefits over the last six months is businesses being more trusted. They've stepped up. Part of that's avoiding government. I think you're going to see companies doing more and more to be trusted. And that's why you see companies coming out with net zero or diversity reports. You're going to see more. Another big one is technology. Like one of the reasons digital transformation is a buzz is because it's a way to be relevant. And if, if you're not relevant to your customers, then, then you won't survive. So I, I think 100% of companies are gonna have to go on their journey of addressing asymmetry, addressing trust and transparency, addressing digital in order to be relevant. So I think 100% of businesses change, change going forward, but I just wouldn't pin it all on the pandemic. I'd, I'd pin it on where the world was going anyways. Multifactorial, certainly multifactorial uh, and two or three huge uh, factors coming into that. You know, Giles, as you look at uh, what your organization has done and you did a great job of overviewing your decision to really lean in on communities of color, I'll ask you the same question. How long and how much of this view will stick? Tim is saying it's 100% and it's gonna, it's gonna stay a long time. What would you say? I think it's just going to increase, actually. Um, <clears throat> at a global level, um, Moa Hennessy as, as, um, already has a huge commitment across many of the different uh, platforms um, that uh, Tim and Stephanie have touched on, environment being a huge topic for us in terms of uh, ensuring that we have a zero footprint. Um, obviously, we're an agricultural product. Wines, champagnes, and cognac comes from grapes. So we know that we have a responsibility back. But if you look specifically to what's happening at the moment with regards to giving back to the community, 
it's absolutely at the forefront of our thought process. So when we were thinking about the next five year plan, it's already baked into our thinking for the, for the future. And there's simply no one who's challenging that thought process within our organization. So you, yes, you have debates around the drivers of success, but when it comes to a commitment to IDE, when it comes to a commitment back to the communities, um, everybody realizes this is absolutely a fundamental part of what we need to be. And when you look at a brand uh, in specifically like Hennessy, because each of our brands is different in terms of um, uh, their consumer base, whether it be Verve Clicquot, whether it be Dom Perignon, or in my case, Hennessy, Hennessy has risen to being the number one most valuable spirit brand in the world. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily know that. But the reason why we've grown to that, um, uh, that, that position is because of the loyalty that we have from our consumers, be they in China, where we are one of the leading um, luxury spirit brands or here in the United States. And in the United States, our success is inextricably li linked to the passion that the African-American, um, Hispanic and Asian consumers have. And everyone knows that. So therefore, it is inherent in our business that we should be giving back to those communities, as well as, as Tim says, making sure that we're providing opportunities then to enjoy the, the products in, in, in great occasions, which therefore um, obviously does create profit for us. But we have to be able to give back. And, and we have initiatives well beyond unfinished business across the board. I mean, Hennessy has been supporting the communities for close to uh, 70, 80 years. This is the latest initiative. But um, even just uh, three years ago, we launched a new program with Thurgood Marshall uh, College Fund, which, as you probably know, supports uh, the historically black colleges and universities. We set up a, a program to help those students go on and be successful in corporate America. That was the vision of the program, to create the Hennessy Fellows Program. Obviously, we're focused on uh, MBA students because we're LDA and above. Um, but we want to equip them with the skills that will let them be successful, because if you look at the Fortune 500, um, there have only been uh, three black CEOs, and we think that that is not a reflection of society. Uh, and likewise, when you talk about the commitment we have with Hispanic Federation or Asian American Business Development Center, um, we've supported Asian American um, women uh, through John's organization. So these, these, are, these are fundamental tenets of how we intend to continue uh, for the future. You've never heard it before, Giles. Cheers to that. Uh, Stephanie, to you, um, when you talk about ESG yeah. programs, talk about Bank of Americas and also talk about the way to evolve it. Uh, is there the risk of moving too fast, like a rubber band stretching too quickly and then snapping? Because you don't want the snap, right? You want to stretch it, but you have to go through, get there in a very deliberate way. Yeah, thank you, Richard. So. Just to build off of what Tim and Giles had said, uh, we learned early on from the financial crisis of 2009 that it's more than just corporate social responsibility. The left hand and the right hand have to be doing and saying the same thing. This is all philanthropic. We invest in a lot of the things around economic mobility. We recognize, and the reason why environmental social governance is so important, that our alliance is businesses, the way we operate as an employer, as a financial institution, has to those same values. And so how are we authentically representing these values and who we are, how we do business, and how we're institutions not only investors, but employers and clients and customers. And so through that lens, Richard, we really thought about um, not only COVID, but um, the racial and economic inequities. And we have this one billion over four year commitment, which really is a, a pronounced way of saying, we need to do something bold, we need to do something actionable, but it's not a one-time thing, it has to be long-term. This momentum to address racism in all its forms and denounce it as a company and to reflect the values of our employees has to be long-term and sustainable. And I know my fellow panelists have said that, but I can't stress it enough because one of the things we've done in addition to our philanthropic commitment and our line of business commitment around investing in minority and minority businesses is ensuring that it's inside it prospectively reflects the outside. And so one of the first things Brian Moynihan did is um, ensure that, excuse me, is ensure that his... Um, we got you, Stephanie. We can see, we can hear you. I think we can. Oh, there you are. Thank okay. You. Okay, okay, there I am. Is ensure that his leadership reflects his commitment to addressing racial representation. 
And so now he has a leadership team that is truly representative of the demographic and the diversity of the United States and of the globe. And then the second thing he did is ensure that hiring practices are long term. So we have this commitment called the Jobs Initiative, where it's not just about promoting within, but ensuring we're building that front pipeline. And last but not least, it's developing products and services that are really reflective of this deliberate and intentional lens on race. So one of the things for the announcement is probably one is 300 million over four years, 200 which is going to entrepreneurs, and a part of it going to minority um, business investment institutions. Uh, so it's not just about distributing the fund, but working with intermediaries like credit unions, or local businesses, local CDFIs, community development financial institutions, get dollars and resources to those who need it most. And so we're taking this multi-pronged approach, but it is truly market-based and it's truly based on authenticity that is important for the consumer. And consumer power is, is the name of the game. So you ask, you know, what percentage of these businesses will be responsible or socially responsible? Consumers are demanding it. And we saw from the BlackRock CEO letter of last year that it's the licensed stuff, right? So you can see a lot of consumers building with their wallet and buying those brands that are reflective of their values as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Tim, um, uh, most sectors will put ESG and DNI in a nice little corner. And there it sits. And it's great to have. It's right there. Is this more DNA thing, something you hear a lot? Is it, is it now this part of the box as opposed to this little bit corner now? How much of it is it now in DNA? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Richard. It's, it's, it's the right question. I would say, candidly, we're in an evolution, right? So um, as we look at many companies, it is still um, in the corner. It's, it's, um, it's in the corner. It's, um, it's going through the growing campaigns, but it's not mainstream. I, I'd say it's not the heart of the business. Like, it's not the heart um, mm -hmm. in the way a line of businesses run or a business unit. We are beginning to see a shift, but as with anything, it, it's gradual, right? So leading leading organizations, and I would I would roughly say, if I were to guesstimate, I'd say 30% of the companies, um, when I think about the, the client base that we have, they're in they're in that it's in the heart, and and that DNA is cha has changed or is changing. Um, How did that? Say, what, what, why do they get to that? That 30%? If you, yeah. yeah, it's 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 one of three reasons. One is um, it often is because the CEO is driving it. And, and we, we should understand that business, it, it takes a long time to change large organizations. Any of us who have operated in large organizations, you don't snap your finger overnight and change them. You have decades and decades and decades of ways business have done. And honestly, it's naive to assume you can change it overnight. Uh, where we see it is one big reason is when the CEO has decided he or she is gonna change it, it, they change it over a period of years. They, they make it part of every meeting. They pay part of the strategy. They make it part of business reviews. They make it the way they do business. And we've seen great examples of that. Um, another reason is, unfortunately, is when a company has an event, like when they have an external event, a, a, a big lawsuit, a big an environmental disaster, a, a, a big something, and then all of a sudden that, that can drive change as well. So one is it's driven from the top because the CEO decides it's going to get done. The second reason is when there's an event. Or well, the third one is some have been there forever. It's small, like it's small, but some have grown up that way. Like they're, it's who they were from the beginning. But, but that's the journey they're on. I've, I've, and many of us have always said some version of the statement, like a company, a, a company is only as good as its top leadership. And what I'm encouraged by is we're seeing more and more top leadership get involved. I, I mentioned the group CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. If I, if I were to estimate the number of CEOs of the last three years where, I, where I've spent one-on-one -on -one conversations talking about how do you make DNI part of the heart of the strategy, I, I would say well over 100, one-on-one -on -one conversations with CEOs of large companies. And I'm encouraged by that because I'm seeing different thinking. They're asking the questions. They're trying to ask, they're asking some version of the question, how do I move it from a something that's on the side, Richard, to use your words, to get it mainstream, I'm encouraged by, I've had over 100 one-on-one -on -one conversations with CEOs on how do you make that happen. Five years ago, I don't think that happens, right? Now that, that's the beginning, you gotta maintain that progress, you then gotta make it happen. But the difference, the different thinking that I'm seeing in the C-suite gives me some encouragement and optimism. 
Yeah, I've got DNI. It's right over here yeah. if you need it. Yeah. If you need it. Um, <laughs> and it, that's my air filter. Uh, Giles, um, you, you know that some of the numbers here that came out in the McKinsey study recently on Asian American communities. I asked this of you because it's related to a lot of your customers, which you're, you're very in tune with. And because of your partnership with AABDC and John Wong on this, you, you know this quite well. I'm just going to put out a couple of statistics, uh, one of which is that Asian American unemployment rates increased by 450% from February to June of this year that is a greater rate of increase than any of the other ethnic groups. Um, often, and, and the term that has been used for, I don't know how many years, model minority myth, in that they're okay, we don't need to talk about them, yet we are seeing at least empirically that this particular group uh, is clearly at risk and has suffered to a greater deg degree than other communities. It's also a, a large percentage of frontline workers during, during COVID as well, something you know well because of your business. Talk about that. What's, what's the gap here in terms of reality versus what we perceive, Giles? No, I think you're, I think you're totally right. And I think that what we've seen um, over the last seven months has been a tremendous impact uh, on the Asian community. And I think another thing that the McKinsey's report um, talks about is how the term Asian community is um, essentially a generic term, when in reality, as you know, there are many, many different Asian communities. And so it's not a one size fits all um, term. If you look That's around right. the country, and you know, for us to be able to make an impact, um, you know, although we have a national or even an international view on what we need to be able to do, it very much comes down to having very much a local touch. And that's why we rely very, very heavily on our local teams, as well as the organizations um, like the Asian American Business Development Center to be able to identify how we can help at a local level. If you take, for example, Houston, um, you know, the base of our Asian community there is very much driven by the Vietnamese community. Um, and so therefore we're very active in terms of supporting at a local level in the, in the Vietnamese community down in, in Houston. Um, I think that um, it's really only in the last couple of years that we've really observed and noticed how the Asian community is beginning to get uh, more recognition. And it's taken a long time for that to happen. Um, you know, Hennessy as a brand was always very active, as I said before, going back decades in supporting um, back from the days when we were Sheffield in the Somerset, we were, uh, we were one of the first companies to support the NAACP. We were one of the first uh, companies to employ a VP who was a black VP who worked for us for 30 years and built our business. But as we move forward today, one of the big sea changes and the shifts that we've made is to really try and drive this idea of equity between the different uh, communities. So that's why it was very much at the heart of our program when we launched Unfinished right. Business, that it should be not just uh, supporting the black community, but also supporting the Asian community as well as um, you know, the Latinx community. And, and even that, in terms of um, the discussions we have with John and Michael, um, you know, talking about how we, um, how we do that, was trying to find the most equitable way now, obviously, one of the things that we've all uh, seen is in the midst of the pandemic, you know, we have the tragedy with George Floyd. And so what's happened is we've doubled down in terms of uh, the pain that everyone's feeling. First, the pandemic, the economic effects, and now the social injustice that's risen to the top. And right now, obviously, there's a, there's a key focus on making sure that we're supporting the black community through this incredibly challenging time. But as an organization, Hennessy is very much committed to taking a polycultural approach and making sure that this is truly an equitable uh, approach for the future. Hey, Giles, you, you heard Tim lay it out. You don't have to use his uh, criteria, uh, but why don't we for a moment? Uh, what in your organization uh, is brought you to these actions and to these results? He yeah. laid out three potential ways that he's seen, at least in his business. Why do you think your business is operating this way? You talked about identifying early on people of color to put 
and, and who have succeeded uh, and were chosen to lead your, your organization at different levels. Yeah, I, I, I listened very intently to, to what Tim talked about in terms of the CEO being a driver, in terms of the C-suite, the events that have uh, shaped companies and, and, and then who they, who they were. I thought those were, were really important. I think for us, there are probably a couple of other elements that you have to look at. One is the fact that take Hennessy, for example, you know, we're a brand that's, brand that's been around for 255 years. Um, that's, um, that's a long time. And, uh, and we shipped our first cases at Hennessy XO. This is actually the 150th anniversary of Hennessy XO. We shipped our first cases at Hennessy XO uh, to China uh, 150 years ago. So um, we have a, a really deep rooted historical connection with communities. Um, when the young black GIs were over in, in France, they were sitting in Parisian cafes drinking cognac. And this was something they discovered and they brought back to the United States with them as their choice of drink because of the way that they were treated by the French when they were liberating Paris. So there's a, there's, a, there's a part that is truly deeply ingrained in the DNA of our individual brands that helps define them. But what I would say is the, is the, the big piece, um, in addition to everything that Tim had said, because we've certainly had great strong leadership from the C-suite, and I think that that's critically, critically important. I also think leadership has to come from the bottom of the company as well and from individual it can't just be the expectation uh, that everything will come from the top of the, the the you know the organization and what i think has been really delighted me over the course of the last five years just seeing the changes within mark hennessy is how so often this is actually being driven by different individuals who are passionate within the organization and who are actually doing as much to actually educate the leadership as the leadership is driving the initiative. And I'll go one step further than that, and it's something that I think is really important. If you work in an international business like I do, uh, and like we all do, uh, sometimes there are cultural, uh, obviously huge cultural differences in how organizations understand what's happening. And if I look at the beginning of the crisis that we've been going through with the pandemic, and I think about the conversations that I've had to have with my colleagues in Paris, with the leadership in Paris, it's been a gentle process of trying to help them really understand what's been happening, not just simply with the pandemic, but with social injustice in the United States. And it's been a journey. It hasn't been a straight line, as Tim was saying. It's been peaks and troughs. But what I think has happened over the course of this is it's been a process of education and a process of building the support that is necessary. So whether it's me being um, given uh, a, a you know, better understanding by the people on my team and then being able to be a champion for them, or whether it's coming from the CEO and how he's driving uh, our commitment to inclusion, diversity, and equity. Um, I think those things have to come together. And I would say to everybody who's uh, watching the webinar today, you have to be proactive yourself. You can be a driver of change. Don't, don't just simply wait for the leadership to make those changes but be vocal about what you see and what should change, because more often than not, you can be closer to the issues. Bravo, Giles. Uh, Stephanie, bravo mm -hmm. to you too. Um, tell me, yes. what, you're snapping your fingers there, is that what you're doing? Uh, talk about as an ESG program manager, <laughs> this very issue of the way Asian American Pacific Islanders are perceived versus the data, another data point, uh, in terms of Asian American Pacific Islanders being part of high contact uh, essential role takers, uh, physicians and surgeons, 20.4%. Mm -hmm. As you know, that uh, the population of America, it's about 7%, 8%, depending on how you're counting it, that are Asian American Pacific Islanders. So they're overrepresented. Registered nurses, 9.8. Um, again, above what the population is. Yet the perception, again, is they're doing okay. Put those, put that all together for us. Sure, absolutely. Let me go back to the, one of the most shocking findings from that McKenzie report, and I hope someone from ABDC can put it in the, the link for everyone to, to read if they haven't already seen the report. One of the most shocking things I saw in the report, which makes me understand why people keep thinking we are that, that myth of model minority is we are, we have the largest wealth disparity within our own group. So we have relatively affluent, well-off, uh, 
sub-Asian populations, and we have many within our own ethnicity group that are struggling day to day. And I think when you see essential workers, when you see the struggles of businesses, when you see the impact of COVID on unemployment, that data matters. But I think even more compelling, not only having this data to overcome any of the politics or misperceptions or myths, right, is having those advocates. So who is taking this data and sharing it with the decision makers? And I will tell you, it, it's so important to have allies, not only externally with organizations like AABDC, but many others at a national level, but across different ethnicities. So we are better together. We support what's happening in the Black community, in the Hispanic community, and they will in turn say there are also issues in the Asian community and in the Native American indigenous community. So that allyship is important from an external standpoint, but from my perspective as a program manager, that allyship is so important from an internal standpoint too. So representation of all ethnicities is important and for purposes of this conversation, so is Asian. But when you have someone who is non-Asian saying, well, what about these issues facing the Pacific Islanders? Well, what about the fact that majority of the Asian community uh, business owners are being impacted by the closure of the economy? That goes volumes because it's mm -hmm. not just someone within the community saying, what about us? But really recognition that this data means something and that we have to take change. I will say three more things. And, and it relates to what Giles and Tim just said around what's motivating us to take that bold uh, action, right? And motivation. It's connecting the head, hand, and heart. So I just referenced the data as connecting to the head. And that's why we really saw some needs around small business, affordable housing, upskilling workforce, and social determinants of health. But it's also the heart. And our employees are the heart of this company. So giving them a chance to speak up, to talk about their firsthand experience, to hear about some of the, the xenophobia that we've been receiving, either in our personal lives or, or when we work at Bank of America and unfortunately experience this racism, that platform to be able to connect with the heart is so critical. And then last but not least is hand. Um, so giving our employees, our customers, our investors the chance to join us in taking action against racism is so important. So it is volunteerism, but it's also investing of your time, talent, and treasure. Thank you. 12 minutes to go for those who are joining us on this webinar. Are, are you awake? Come on, uh, ask a question uh, of our great guest here in the Q&A section, and I will get to it. Tim, what is one number you are watching right now relevant to our conversation? What's one number that you're watching? Yeah, so the, the broad number is I'm watching representation um, inside our firm and for other companies. I, I think at the end of the day, the di like dialogue is important. Um, the McKinsey report is good, but honestly, we don't need another report. Like, I, 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 think, I think we all have to man up or woman up and just say, look, the data, like, we don't need another report that tells us what 20,000 other reports have already told us. For me, it's all about moving the dial inside PwC and outside, outside PwC. That's at the board level, the leadership team level, the C-suite level, the hiring level, recruiting levels. And uh, uh, again, I'm encouraged by activity, but um, see, as a CEO, it's about outcomes at the end of the day. And so we're, what I'm focused on is representation, and then you can break that down into what I just did, board C-suite. Sure. I, yep. I do wanna just share, and I think many of your listeners will know this, um, we took a major step. Um, uh, on August 26th, we went out with our first ever DNI transparency report. Um, it set a new bar for corporate America on the level of transparency, just in case you're now Googling it on our site. Uh, I won't bear the headline, it's not a perfect story. Um, mm -hmm. By any stretch, we haven't arrived, uh, but we've made a ton of progress over the last several years. With um, In our industry, I don't believe the pipeline argument is, is a good argument. Pipelines out there, you gotta look in the right places. So, I realize other industries are the same way, but we've made great strides in recruiting. We've made great strides on partner emissions, and we've made great strides on my leadership team and our board. We also have major room for improvement in certain areas, particularly retention of women and underrepresented minorities. But I, again, I call up B of A because I think they are doing a great job. They also have a similar transparency report out there. But I think, I think we need to have the courage to talk beyond activities and specifically, Richard, to the number that what you're asking about, for me, the number is about representation, not in the rearview mirror, because we know the answer. Like, honestly, the studies, every study is yeah. confirming the same problem. Well, you know it's uh, supply and demand. Uh, it's not going to be one or the other, and it oscillates back and forth. So, Tim, what are you going to do at PwC to increase that number? And what is that number now? 
Yeah, so, well, it depends what number you're talking about, right? So, our, our, so um, a couple of things. So, we've been doing a ton over the last several years. Our recruiting classes the last two years have been record recruiting classes for underrepresented minorities, in particular Blacks and Hispanics, which is where we were lacking. And that's laid out in the transparency report. Our partner admissions class in each of the last two years has been, has been 50% women and underrepresented minorities. And that, that's, I just gave you the outcome. Now you ask, what are we doing? What we're doing is we are managing at the heart of the business. Like it goes back to the question you asked me earlier. We, are, we have development programs, we have mentors, we have accountability, we have sponsorship. I'm personally involved in those processes mm-hmm. and all those activities are driving outcomes. We, like many organizations that are large, we have a big denominator, right? So I, like I have to be patient as a, a very passionate and hands-on CEO. When you have a 55,000 person denominator, it, it progress when you're adding to the numerator, which is a problem most companies have, you, you have to realize it's going to take time, but that's not an excuse for not taking action. So what I'm really looking at is not just the, the denominator, but I'm looking at progress on the numerator in every, every single area. At the same time, I'm being very careful not to alienate the majority because to, to Jaws' point, which I wholeheartedly agree, everybody plays a role. And so we are actively and have been for the last three or four years talking to the majority, explaining the why, listening to their views, making sure we don't leave them behind, making sure it isn't interpreted as us telling what their politics should be. And going back to the question you asked, and that's Stephanie made, it's a business imperative. Like it's consumers. So um, I gave you the outcomes and I, and I gave you the activities that are driving those. Um, you have to make it not a zero sum game. Uh, and I got to tell you, in my organization at NBC Universal and Comcast NBC Universal, our chairman of the news group over CNBC, MSNBC, and NBC News uh, came out with the 50% initiative and gave statistics. We don't typically do that in my business. We don't talk about that. You know, there's not a lot of people that look like me, but now it's out there uh, very clearly. We need more folks that look like me. well, not exactly like me. Giles, uh, w- what's the number that you are looking at relevant to our conversation today? We've, um, we have a new uh, leadership team at the moment, and it's fantastic that uh, the, the leadership team that I sit on is committed to the um, vision around sort of the 50%. We haven't defined it like that. I think that one of the things that we were very early to address was women in leadership and uh, addressing the gender equality basis first. Um, on a brand like Hennessy, as I've mentioned before, because of the, uh, the consumer of Hennessy, we've been further ahead in terms of the representation. So take a case in point, take, take my team, for example. Um, we're about uh, 20% black, 25% Asian, 20% Latin, mm. and, and then the balance is, is, is uh, white Americans or Europeans. And we're about 80% women in leadership, which is probably um, an outlier in, in that regards. But what we know we need to do, as Tim said, is we know that we have to uh, the, to change that makeup across the board over time uh, yeah. because there are functions and areas where there's still a lot of opportunity. Uh, and, and that 50% um, uh, kind of mark is really what, what we would be uh, working towards, although we haven't qualified it specifically in, in those terms to the company. Mm. Great stuff. Stephanie, what number are you watching relevant to our conversation? Yeah, so from a philanthropy and a program standpoint, we are trying to be more accountable with how we're attributing the one billion over four years. We want to ensure that there's parity in giving in the communities we serve, not only relative to the philanthropy, but into the rep- uh, in regards to the representation of communities of color. So if there's a community that is predominantly, for example, Asian, is our our funding, our philanthropy reflective of that parity of percentage in giving. But I think from a broader enterprise standpoint, we know that we can't do it alone. We know that we're not perfect and we have so much more to offer, more to do to be better at being anti-racist. Um, from a ESG standpoint, I think our mantra is it's shared success. And so one of the things we've done recently in addition to the one billion is offer a public bond that mm-hmm. enables fixed income investors to also join us in investing in addressing racial and economic inequities. So I think from an ESG standpoint, it would be interesting to see if these investors, everyday citizens who who believe that this is important and can use the advocacy of the wallet, 
will invest in this public bond, um, one of eight, the first ever offered by a financial institution to say that it's not only the right thing to do, but it's also good for me personally and it'll generate some income. So we're monitoring that to see if people want to invest in this $2 billion uh, bond that we just announced. Okay, so all of you may be authors already. I'm sorry I did not uh, do my research on that. What's the title <laughs> of your book about this topic? Sorry, Tim, you happen to be, I, I'll go to Giles this time first. Giles, what is the title of the book, Giles, that you would write about this topic? Uh, everyone can, yeah, everyone can individually make a difference. Great, Stephanie. Um, take action now and build allies. And Tim. Don't miss the biggest opportunity for a society to make a difference. Mine is uh, do what doesn't make sense. Mm. Uh, so Stephanie. Um, Provocative. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know if yeah. I could write three words. Uh, Stephanie, uh, we're <laughs> down to the last three minutes. You, you've got 30 seconds. Uh, tell us something that we can do differently tomorrow. Something that's bite-sized and, and, and finish this up. Everybody will get 30 seconds on this. So proximity of lived experience is so critical. We can say we care, we could say we do action, but if we're not creating solutions with the communities we're looking to help, then we're missing the point. And so for those of us on the phone who are from nonprofits or businesses alike, it's important that those we're looking to help are in the room, at the table, sharing their lived experience as a way to shape the strategy. Thank you, you stuck the time, wow. Uh, Tim. Yep, so I'm gonna break it up and I'll do it in 30 seconds. If you are a CEO, drive the change from the top. Like own it, drive the change from the top. If you are, and I agree with Giles, if you are somebody who is working in an organization, you can do three specific things. If you're the majority, talk and begin to understand how underrepresented minorities feel and real and listen and, and, and grow your understanding. Second thing, all, all of us can take unconscious bias training on a regular basis because there's a science. And thirdly, visit the CEO Action website because there's over 800 best practices by company name where you can learn and don't have to recreate the wheel. And you don't have to pay for it. Yeah, Child. and it's free. <laughs> and it's free. I love what Tim said earlier about how he's spoken to about 100 different CEOs over the past couple of years. My point would be take yourself out of your comfort zone, have the conversations with people that you might not normally have conversations with, listen and learn. That's the most important thing you do. I think what we're seeing in America too much at the moment is people just sticking in a camp that they feel comfortable in, not trying to understand the views of different organizations, different individuals. So educate, listen and learn. Yeah, Giles, I agree with that one. I, I always say make a list of three people you could never ever see yourself hanging out with and then go invite them out for lunch uh, and keep on doing that. You know, what a great conversation and thank you all three, uh, Stephanie, Tim and Giles for, for you know, giving us your time. Uh, I know we all have busy uh, calendars at the moment and for all of those folks also who decided to join us for this webinar sponsored by AABDC, let's return to a better workplace, this three part series, it's the last part you can find it online uh, at their website. This will be available later uh, in the week, I've been told. Uh, for now, I, I've learned a lot. So thank you again to all of our panelists for investing in this conversation. Uh, I hope we get to do it again. Uh, so for now, everybody have a great day and thank you for your time and enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you so much. Bye.